I have your attention? Right. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you to Fort Lee. We're members of the Second Continental Artillery. We're going to shoot a three-pounder gun. A gun is a long-barreled artillery piece. Long barrel, long barrel, long barrel. When I say it's a three-pounder, it shoots a solid three-pound ball about the size of a tennis ball. That thing shoots an 18-pound ball. That shoots a 32-pound ball. A ball that does not explode. It is a solid ball. If there are ships coming through the passage, uh, we're bringing up another gun. Oh. And you see how it's manhandled into place? Using people power to move the gun on the battlefield. In order to make guns like that more effective, they actually sunk ships down below us and on the other side of the river so the ships have to go through the center of the channel. And guess where our guns are sighted? The center of the channel. So we can try and sink them. Now, we're at Fort Lee. There's another fort called Fort Washington. Fort Washington is over there. Can anybody tell me why Fort Washington isn't located right over there? Anybody got an idea? There's there there's a number of reasons. Geography, dominant ground. This gun right here. There's a blue dome off in the distance from a church. That's about two miles away. We can hit that church. Can anybody tell me why now? Why there isn't a fort right across from us? Well, if we miss, if we're shooting at a ship and we miss, what do we hit? Not the other four. Is that good for you to be shooting back and forth at each other to your own guys? No. Probably not. So these two forts are trying to control the Hudson River at this point. One of the issues that happen is if you get a British ship sailing and is moving pretty fast, how much time do you have to hit it? Not very long. And if you don't hit the ship enough, what happens? It keeps on going. So you had two British ships, the Phoenix and the Rose, they actually ran the fire of these forts and they took a little bit of damage but it didn't stop them. So how effective are these forts? Not really. <laughs> Not really, kind of. So, hey, we're Americans, we're learning. <laughs> this little guy right here, this is what you're gonna see moved with the armies. It's a very light maneuverable gun it is a bronze barrel, which is a tin and copper alloy. It's about nine parts copper, one part tin. It is a very strong metal, and it's very strong for its weight. So because bronze is so strong and lighter metal, it doesn't need a big, heavy, huge carriage. Though this is a six-pounder, a bigger gun, since it's made out of iron, it weighs a lot more than a bronze six-pounder, so the carriage has to be bigger. So overall, an iron gun is far harder to move than a bronze gun. Also, if you're an artillery guy and you stress an iron gun, there's a possibility if you shoot it too much, it'll shatter. Bronze guns are very kind. They don't shatter if you overstress them. However, because the iron guns tend to be way overbuilt, 
they tend to hold up better for long sustained firing. If you're doing a siege where you have cut off a city or a fort and you're prolonged shooting cannonballs in there, the iron guns are probably going to hold up better. You would actually see bronze guns because you have the different melting points of the copper and the tin that they'll actually start to droop and then become ineffective. So we're gonna go through the loading and firing of this gun. It's a pretty simple process. You can fire these guns pretty fast. A good crew can get at least two to three rounds out a minute if you go through it very fast, but you only carry anywhere from 30 to 60 rounds which is a combination of the solid cannonball which if you're shooting at formations of infantry it's like a bowling alley at close in work you can switch to case shot which is a tin can for this guy it would be 36 iron balls or you add something known as canister, which is a tin can filled with musket balls. Those are gonna be about two to 300 yards. The solid shot is gonna be about 800 to 1,000 yards. So we'll go through the loading procedure. The first thing we're gonna to wanna to do, every third or fourth round, you're gonna to wanna to take a corkscrew type device called a wad hook or a worm and pull out the remnants of the powder bags. The powder bag is either a paper bag or it's a wool flannel cartridge. And that debris possibly will build up inside the barrel. So you want to pull that debris out with that rod hook. You have the outside of a sheep, the sponge. And when that is inserted in the bore, with someone covering the vent, which is the hole on the top of the gun. If you listen, when they pull it, hear that thump? We've created a vacuum and hopefully have extinguished any embers left over from the previous charge. Road with solid shot. Now, here is a three pound ball. Here is an entire cartridge. This is far easier to load. It's one piece. Here's the powder in the bag. Here's the wooden sabo that it's attached to. Here are the tin bands. You just put this in one piece down in there. You can also separate it, but it's gonna take you more time. This is a fixed charge. Now, we're gonna break open the powder bag using a copper pick with a copper and tin barrel. You don't create sparks. And you hold it like this so that if it does go off, you don't have the force possibly. If you do it like this, it may, you may end up waving to people like this for the rest of your life. <laughs> We have an elevating screw to raise or lower the barrel. But this is basically a point and shoot. There they are, I see them, I point the barrel at them and then fire. Now we happen to have a lint stock which is, has a rope that's been treated with a chemical, basically potassium nitrate, so it'll burn slowly. It's also known as slow match. You can also use what's known as a port fire, which has about the same chemical composition as a car flare. And port fires, just like car flares, they'll burn through very, very wet conditions. Think ready? Okay. We ready? Fire! Oh, oh. 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 All right, that is one artillery piece going off. You can imagine on a battlefield where there's many of them, then musket fire, how smoky and obscured the battlefield might be based on that. Ha <laughs> ha
Now, so much for that video. this is a three pounder. Imagine how this, however, prior to the attack on Fort Washington, November 16th, and Fort Lee was evacuated November 20th, earlier that year, you had two British frigates, the Phoenix and the Rose, they actually ran the gauntlet of both of these forts and made it all the way up to the Tappan Zee. If you're an American, what lesson do you take from this? Get the hell out of here. The forts really aren't doing what they're intended to do because the British ships were able to run the... Yeah, they took a little bit of damage. Other than trying to control the Hudson River, what do these forts do? Other than the fact you hold the ground where the fort is. Once the British captured New York City, which they had effectively done by September, these forts would be known, as Washington would call it, a cipher of little or no value. Fort Washington had about 2,800 guys in it with all kinds of cannons, war material, just sitting there. This place was heavily fortified with a lot of war material. Just sitting there of little or no strategic value. And then the British finally decide they're going to take out all their frustrations of how the American army had gotten away from them in the move up Manhattan and put everything they had against Fort Washington. Fort Washington, 2,800 soldiers Americans captured. Innumerable cannons, muskets, shovels, picks, everything you need to fight a war captured by the British. This is November 16th. And I ask the question, if you're the American commander here, it's the night of November 16th, morning of November 17th, what do you need to do? Get out of here. Get out! Anybody know how many days they sat here? They sat here for three days until they finally go, oh, we should get out of here. <laughs> it was the 20th. Again, we lost a lot of valuable war material. Where are you going to go to? Well, they head that way. Heading down to the safety of, actually, Pennsylvania. And then the British chases all across New Jersey. <laughs> that point in the war, we're probably about that close. Yeah. No one's tougher, no one is more resilient than Washington, and he writes to a number of people, by the time you get to the middle part of December, if something doesn't happen, I think the game is pretty near up. And instead of sitting around waiting on What's going on? What does Washington do? He seizes the initiative and crosses the Delaware. And the British had garrisoned most of New Jersey. I imagine there's a lot of New Jersey people. I'm from New York. How many New Jersey people go, hey, you British guys, you're all right, yay! And then Washington crosses, routes the German auxiliaries, the Hessians at Trenton, and the British send out a big force to go get them. And that wily guy, he goes around them and attacks the British at Princeton and roughs them up. And then the British go, these Americans, they gotta have thousands and thousands and thousands of guys. They spring up armies like so many weeds. So if you're a British commander, if you're worried like that, what do you start doing? I can't leave these little groups of guys out here anymore. So I'm gonna pull back almost to New York City. What about all those people from New Jersey who said, yeah, the king, you're pretty cool. <laughs> so what lesson does that tell the rest of the country? When the British army comes by, unless you're willing to stake everything you own in your life, that they're going to win, you just kind of wave. The Americans come by, you just kind of wave. Is you don't risk everything because the king's forces can win battles. <laughs> <laughs>
and they're very good at it. <laughs> they're the best army in the world, hands down. They can't control the territory once they go through, and that's the lesson. So you have two different groups, even though we're almost identical. We could be Bobsy twins. <laughs> Blue coats, red facings, plain brass buttons, plain brass buttons. I got into trouble with my regiment. I was reprimanded for not having a gilded coat agreeable to the custom of the regiment, not having little, just like made out of with my epaulette, around my buttonholes. If, if I did have that, my uniform would be nearly indistinguishable from a British Royal Artillery officer. So the American uniform and the British uniform are almost exactly the same. If you saw Germans serving with the British forces, they have a blue and red coat. The French artillery have a blue and red coat. The Spanish artillery have a blue and red coat. The Prussian artillery, you see kind of a pattern here? That's just a custom amongst the artillery is to adopt that color combination. The American artillery are going to learn the hard way, which is a good way and a bad way. You're going to lose, you're going to get roughed up, but you're going to figure it out, whoever survives. The British artillery, they had four battalions. They had elements of the first, third, and the fourth who served over here, plus the Royal Irish Artillery, which were a small group recruited in uh, Ireland. And excellent, excellent troops. The British Army is an excellent army, but as I said, you can defeat us in every battle. We live here. We've got nowhere to go. You have to make us give up. And I'll throw this out to people. If something bad is happening in California, and my brother lives out there, does it really affect you? Does it really? Is it going to change your day-to-day -day life? Not really. I live in New York. Something bad happened in Virginia to the Americans. Oh, darn. It's really hard to find a decisive place, a decisive moment to defeat the American forces that's going to make us give up because everything is so compartmentalized. And the British will go all throughout the country. Every major American city at one point in time was captured by the British. Did it make us quit? No, we just moved on. You have to understand, as a British soldier, it's our occupation. We didn't enlist to fight here in America. It's our occupation. It's what we do. We just happen to be sent here. His men enlisted. There was no Continental artillery. They enlisted for one reason, to defend their homeland. Big and, difference. And again, as I said, we got nowhere to go. We can take the long view. We can send you to Australia. Well, and that's what we told you <laughs> when you tried to dump our, your criminals here after the war. You ain't doing it anymore. So, now, as we're learning, these are point and shoot guns. There's the enemy. You point the barrel at him and you shoot him. There are more sophisticated types of artillery which take a little bit of know-how to use them effectively. You have mortars. This one is a mortar. It shoots a shell, a hollow iron ball that happens to be an eight inch. Inside the ball, it's about two thirds of the way filled up with powder. There is a fuse. There is a propelling charge. The more powder you put in the mortar, the further the shell is going to go. The less powder, the less it's going to go. With the mortar, there's a couple ways to fire it, which I would never do the first thing, which the French mention it's firing at two strokes, where you ignite the fuse and then you ignite the propelling charge for the mortar. What 
the Americans tended to do is on one of our manuals we would dust we would take grease smear it all around where the fuse is dust that with powder so that when the propelling charge goes off the flame from that ignites the powder around the fuse and that ignites the fuse I happen to have at my house an 8 inch shell from another fort that was fired and it's attacked so it tells you sometimes the fuses they don't work but generally the technology is going to work so that thing is going to be used generally to fire against a fort or defend a fort you're not going to be able to do good on a ship with that the odds of you hitting a ship or getting close to it and with a fuse if you cut the fuse too long well it goes in the water unless you hit the ship dead on or if you cut it too short it blows up before it gets near the ship there is a type of artillery piece halfway between the mortar and the gun called a howitzer howitzers only shoot exploding shells but they give you the capability to move it because it has big wheels like these mortars mortars are very tough to move you will not see them normally on a battlefield Howitzers, you see them normally in sieges, but they're a lot more easy to move around. The guns, gun, 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 gun. Long barreled, it generally, with the big ones, it's about a third of the weight. 18 pounder takes a six pound propelling charge for a solid iron ball. Solid iron balls don't blow up. What are you going to use something like that against? If you're attacking a fort, the fort has generally a palisaded wooden wall holding up dirt. The dirt is what is absorbing everything. All the stone of the fort or the palisade is holding up the dirt because the dirt can take numerous impacts, but it only so many. And once you start a siege firing with big monsters like that, you don't stop. Because if you stop, especially at night, the enemy goes out with shovels and shovels dirt back in where you're trying to batter the walls down. And once you make a breach in the enemy's wall, normally you give the courtesy of a summons. <laughs> Say that we busted a big hole in your wall. You either surrender or if I have to assault, I'll kill everybody because I'm going to lose so many guys. And you know what the enemy usually is going to do? They're going to quit <laughs> before that happens. So the 18, 24 pounders, the mortars, howitzers are generally going to be used to defend or attack a fort using the combination of the solid shot and the shells. These guys are going to be, look at the manhandling with the ropes. When this thing gets maneuvered on the battlefield, there's your maneuver. It's the crew. Same with us. It's the crew. We have our drag ropes up there. The horses, they're too valuable to put in the line of fire. If I'm, with, especially with the Americans, we have a hard time getting, oh, they do too is I'd have my horse hidden out of sight. The horse can drag this gun for quite a distance. Not us, not so much. So you really want to be conservative and protect your horses as your movement, long range movement. So your maneuvering on the battlefield is generally going to be the guys. All right, we're going to go. Where, where are we going? Order first. Okay. Their yep. gun. Oh, okay, sure. All right. All right, so we're going to... Are you going to go over and shoot the mortar now? This one's the oh, the little guy. Okay. We'll start off with shooting our little mortar, grenade launcher. Ready? Fire! <laughs> wow. All right, and shooting a tennis-sized ball. It's going to blow up, kind of ruin your day. They're going to shoot their gun now. All right. Now the Royal Artillery is going to go and shoot their gun.
Stand back. Clear. Slow. Five. Third. Native budget. Advance around. Five. Slow. Called January morning in 1781, the British Army had made an attack at a place called the Cowpens, and the British attack completely collapsed in the face of this inspired American defenses. And the Americans counterattack, and there were two British guns supporting that attack. And by the time the Americans get close, there's a lone British guy near one of the guns, standing bravely to his piece. And an American is about ready to kill him, and an American officer interposes himself and says, "This guy's too brave to die." There's your Royal Artillery. <laughs> yeah, we'll wait for him to get clear. We've got river traffic. Uh, take him out. Fire. <laughs> take him out. Take him out. Let's see which one of us can hit it. He's <laughs> running away. Uh, <laughs> Coast Guard will get. But the boat's running away. All it takes is one person. As I said, there's eight million over there. All it takes is one. So the odds are greater someone over there will come for They will, from that angle, they will see a flame coming out of these guns. So it would be a little scary to them. There is a six to nine foot flame that shoots out of the front of these guns. Mm. What a marvelous time to see these guns fired is at night. Yes. Oh, wow. Where through the vent, the hole on the top, the cool is see the flames shooting up <laughs> out of that vent. Damn. Fire! Woo! Search the All right, does anybody have any questions at all? <laughs> any questions? Well, how, how